And I stupidly, cleverly, I don't know, opened my mouth and said, you know, what I want is the deep end. Um, and the the first thing, the first proper project I was chucked onto was with a, a one other guy, and we were given a project for U.S. Special Forces, um, and it was like it was traumatizing, you know. It's just this is yours, <laughs> don't fuck it up. <laughs> so. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host. Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with industrial designer Neil Ferrier. Neil Ferrier, who worked previously in advanced product design development at Oakley, is a mechanical engineer by degree and the owner of industrial design firm Discommon, which specializes in left of center bespoke goods. Aside from reinventing classic accessories like the impact protectant watch wallets made with space grade foam that hardens upon impact, I wanna hear about that, to fully machined aluminum whiskey tumblers. Now you're speaking my language. Neil's company was responsible for securing a Boeing cargo plane to land in Hong Kong, pick up millions of PPE masks and deliver them to the healthcare system in South Carolina. His portfolio of projects ranges in both in scale and industry. He's designing custom Air Jordans in collaboration with BOA and the shoe surgeon one day and building portable iPhone powered ultrasound carrying cases and accessories the next. Dynamic is an understatement. As a fan of Jordan 1, I'm really curious to hear more about these and other projects, of course, to get to know Neil better as well. So, okay, kids, all the way from Greenville, South Carolina, please welcome Neil Ferrier. Neil, welcome to Obsessed Show. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thank well, you very hey, much for having me. It's awesome to have you on the show here. Um, I've seen a lot of your stuff on Instagram and, you know, just a variety kind of as we talked about in your bio of crazy different things. Before we get into all of those different things, I'm really curious to hear like how we find you here to begin with, with an engineering background. Tell us a little bit about your origin story as a designer. And Yeah, it is a funny one, I think, that... Um, I don't know how many you know mechanical engineers uh, now own industrial design firms. Um, <laughs> I guess I'd like to think that it's sort of one of our superpowers now, um, in that we you know, are very focused on product that becomes real. Uh, but I, uh, I had that toss up uh, when I was going to university of will I do design school or will I do engineering school? And I realized I just wasn't good enough at drawing for the, the portfolio side. <laughs> I felt like it was all there in my head, but I wasn't good enough at drawing to just, you know, ace the entry into design school. And I was always, you know, thoroughly fascinated with physics. Um, so, so mechanical engineering just seemed very practical and like it would make my, my parents, you know, content. Ah, good. He's doing a good degree. Um, but <laughs> I am a passionate mechanical engineer. You know, I, I, uh, the masters in it and uh the the origins of discommon um which you know we say stands for disruptive and uncommon did start in you know late high school and in university where i realized and, and refused to do the common paths i could probably have a, a long conversation with a therapist about that but um I, I was always the one that wanted to do something differently or go down a different path uh and like that was evident in my work experience at university. I um, I worked for free one summer for ProDrive, who at the time ran the Subaru World Rally Team, um, just because I wanted to wrench on race cars. And uh, for other summers, I was a caddy um, at Glen Eagles, a big golf resort. Um, and you know, other friends were off working in the oil and gas industry or doing good, you know, engineering jobs. And I just I don't know. I had other things going on in my head. I wanted to learn about people. Like caddying was phenomenal for, for dealing with people. You know, if you don't have rapport with that person on the first hole, this is going to be a, this is a rough next five hours for you. Um, and so all these little weird um, things that I did just, uh, I think, shaped a little bit of an uncommon approach. And then that came out of my first job as well, which was with Oakley. Uh, my first proper job was with Oakley, uh, which my short list of who I wanted to work with coming out of university um, was just people that did weird stuff. It was Ariel Atom. The, the car company was very young at the time. It was um, Ping Golf Club because I found them to be pretty good rebels in the golf industry. Um, but Oakley was high up there. I'd used them doing sport the whole time. 
and uh, I just went on this hell bent route to try and get into this crazy sunglass company in Southern California whilst living in Scotland. You know, growing up, uh, you know, I was in high school in the early nineties and, you know, the first time I remember distinctly being at Walt Disney world. And the first time I saw a dude wearing the wraparound Oakley's with kind of the bent, uh, arm on the side of the piece on the earpiece. Yeah. And like, I was like, what are those? That is the craziest sunglasses I've ever seen. And then to get up close and like, see the logo with the stacked letters and like, just <clears throat> in my mind, in my early development, like that was kind of they were really pushing the envelope. What, what was it like working there um, when you were there? I mean, they, they were, and they do push the envelope. I mean, I had the same memory. So, you know, Glen Eagles, where I caddied, um, you know, Glen Eagles is in this town called Ochter Arder, where I'm from, 4,000 people. Um, but, you know, Glen Eagles is quite a high-end hotel. And the golf pro shop had the metal Oakley case in it, the hallowed, like, you know, pale metal case in it. <laughs> and I just used to look at it in awe of like, how do these people create these little things, these, these jewels, you know, to, to all extent. And so and more than one, uh, probably 20 good caddying rounds went to getting, you know, things with fire iridium lenses or the first titanium things or whatever. So, um, you know, Oakley, just crushed that sort of lust factor, you know, in, in our era of, of growing up with product. And I mean, working there was, you know, as it said on the box, you know, the, the headquarters is a spaceship. Um, within the first week, you know, I was handed an envelope of cash and sent in the back of like a military s pickup truck. It was a Hummer, a Hummer H1 to go get kegs for the design department. <laughs> and I just, just remember asking, am I allowed to do this? You know, is that okay? <laughs> Um, you know, and it's the CEO telling you to do it. He doesn't even know your name. You're just getting shoved <laughs> in the back of a you Hummer. Get the um, beer. So it was a, you know, it was a baptism for sure. Um, but it was also unrelenting in the expectation of how you would obsessively execute on a project. Um, it was an arena of type A personalities and if you ever wanted there to be a day where somebody like patted you on the back and said, good job, kid, like that was not the place. Like it was alphas everywhere who were ready to do better things than you were. Um, and I stupidly, cleverly, I don't know, opened my mouth and said, you know, what I want is the deep end. Um, and the the first thing, the first proper project I was chucked onto was with a, a, one other guy and we were given a project for U.S. Special Forces. Um, and it was like, it was traumatizing, you know, it's just, this is yours. Don't get <laughs> <pick> up. <laughs> so it was, it was good. Nice. Well, I, I want to dig into some of your project work as well, but I'm really curious to hear you tell this story about the, uh, landing the airplane <laughs> full of PPE. Yeah, I guess that's, that's like a left field. Okay. So, um, th and this, this allows me to speak, I suppose, a little bit about the business because you Google this common, what you see is a company that makes niche men's products. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, I'm not, well, sometimes I'm an idiot, but in general, like I try to be quite tactical to do with business <laughs> and those things that you see, they're a terrible business model. Um, in that, you know, if you are obsessive, like we are, if you make a $70,000 table, in reality, that table has cost you $65,000 to make. This is not a money printing exercise, making these goods. In fact, it's, it's probably money recuperating. It's exercise. probably revenue negative. Um, however, what it did buy me, especially in the first years of starting this company was sort of like marketing. Um, how that relates to the plane is that um, we have a bread and butter business of being an industrial design firm. We work heavily with food and drinks industry, um, sports, and currently medical. And we're very quiet about it. I don't think there's that much on the internet about us, but we're, we're fortunate. We've got some great clients. And we, because of my time and because I was an engineer, um, there are certain plastics, metals, things that because of Oakley, I'm incredibly comfortable with. And I've done the like sleeping beside the injection mold machine. My head of engineering is one of the design engineers I worked with for 10 years at Oakley. We do know how to make stuff well. And this uh, company, Butterfly, um, they make a handheld ultrasound device. Their company just went public on the New York Stock Exchange. Really cool, changing healthcare in general. Um, we're their design firm, but we also manufacture their accessories because they are focused on making incredible medical tech. And their accessories, injection molded plastics that, that we just have a really good handle on. 
how that leads to the plane is we're making stuff in medical factories in, in China and COVID comes along and, you know, all our retainers get halved. Um, everybody's in defense mode. Uh, and, you know, it's, I got employees and family and uh, I pride myself on trying to just adapt to scenarios. Okay. If we lose a client, what, what does that mean? Like, what do we, what does it now give us the freedom to do? What was mm-hmm. that client stopping us from doing? And so when this happened, my, my guy in China said, you know, Neil, um, I'd really like to send you over some masks for your family and uh, to make sure you're safe. And I, and I said, wait, I don't understand. I, I thought there's like no masks in the world. And he said, Neil, you manufacture in a medical company, in a, in a factory, like we make masks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my first take on this was actually, uh, and I'm glad I look back on this with a little bit of pride. My first take was to approach our local hospital system, which is basically the whole of South Carolina, and ask if I was able to donate some masks. And I wanted to donate 10,000. It was like a manageable amount for me. Never thought about manufacturing, importing, anything like that. Um, but within, I mean, hours that day, uh, I reached out to one of our senators um, in South Carolina and he put me in touch with somebody there. And within hours, I was in their purchasing office and they were just like, who are you? What, like, all of these <laughs> things, brokers, they're full of shit. There's people, there's money disappearing. This is awful right now. Mm. I was like, well, I'm not a broker. Like, I work, I, we make stuff in the factory. We would be making your product. And then there was a PO and then we were making masks. I very quickly partnered up with Casemate, very, very large uh, cell phone case company. Uh, They're a client of ours, very good friends, but they had manufacturing power and logistics power, like similar to, if not better than ours. And my friends there said, we can do this. Like we can actually make an effect, you know, help here. The plane though. So at this point in time, there's no shipping coming out. So there's no commercial flights coming out of Asia, uh, they're not allowed into the US, and that means there is no, commercial flights all carry cargo as well. So there's no cargo going out. And, you know, these big overwhelming problems, I just treat as a series of smaller problems. I try not to get overwhelmed with them. They're just a series of problems. you got to overcome one thing at a time. Um, and we started, you know, uh, any of the high net worth individuals that we'd worked with on bespoke stuff, I started calling and asking, Do any of you have, I mean, this is absurd phone calls, any of you have access to a BBJ, a Boeing business jet? Can we get a plane? At one point in time, I actually put an American Airlines plane on my Amex after a phone call to American <laughs> Express asking them. So I've got this business platinum card and it says that there's no spending limit. I feel like that must be a lie. <laughs> like, <laughs> Can you explain to me what what no spending limit is? <laughs> but basically, all these people are trying to get out of China with stuff. And uh, we eventually got connected through Clemson to somebody at Boeing. And they were like, we got you. Like, we'll help. Um, we've got this thing called uh, Dreamlifter. Um, I was like, I've heard of that. It looks like a beluga whale. It's massive. They're like, yeah, it's one of the biggest planes yeah. in the world. And then I broke... I, I, I broke down in tears. Like, I, like somebody just solved my problem. Like I've made the masks. You're telling mm-hmm. me we can get them to people. And they just, I've got, I get chills just doing this. Now. I just yeah, got crazy goosebumps. Awesome. Uh, you know, somebody just offered this kid a plane. And I said, where would I land it? And they said, well, we're actually based out of Charleston, <laughs> South Carolina. And then the mischief of me kicked in. And I was like, fuck that. I want to land this in Greenville. Like this is where they're headquartered. I want to land this in my town. Oh, that's <laughs> and awesome. so called Greenville Airport. They, they just freaked out. And they're like, actually, we can receive FedEx 747s. You can land at the airport. Mm. Boeing were a dream. Like, they were amazing. But they were only allowed to fly out of Hong Kong. And that that's a story for a book. Like, that involved riverboats and containers on riverboats <laughs> and people getting bonuses to move things oh, wow. around. And it, I just... I just look back at it like it was some form of days, but we moved a lot of millions of masks in for the, the, the state. And it was pretty funny, you know, the governor and all the senators and stuff showed up at the airport and everybody took credit for it. I just kind of like sat watching it all just in his days of like, this, <laughs> they gave me a plane. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> That's so awesome. What were they thinking? <laughs> so it was really fun. Um, and you know the reality of this. To, to speak candidly, I feel like it's important we all talk about real stuff. Uh, 
that wasn't philanthropic, but it certainly was not profit earning. Um, mm-hmm. But after you've done that, you're allowed to knock on the door of Target and Walmart and things like that and say, we're able yeah. to do this. Um, and it sustained my business through COVID. We, we didn't, you know, all these people, these stories of millions and millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars of these people doing like, oh, you know, the, the Congo needs 2.9 billion masks and we want to mm-hmm. broker this something or other. We didn't do any of that. We just, we stuck to what we make this. Um, we can customize it if you want it for your hospital or your city and we'll deliver it, you know? Um, so uh, it was good. To, it was a very strange, like left field thing for the company, but it kept us alive. You know, it kept the employees safe. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you kind of hinted at this already. You know, if you look at your website or Instagram, you have a lot of like what I would consider luxury goods or yep. higher end, really cool, super design mm-hmm. products and soft goods and, like, even if you just stay in the luxury lane, like your variety of things that you guys have made is all over the map. Like, what is, um, like, is there anything you don't design? <laughs> is it pretty much soup you know, to nuts or what, what does the universe of, of products, um, look like for you? That That's a really interesting question. And it's, it, it actually gets a very humble reaction for me, but the, the words will not sound humble. And by that, I mean, we are game for anything because I think that the richest output of a designer comes from making them uncomfortable. Mm. Because if somebody just stays in their lane, they're going to go cruise control. So we like to say designer discomfort. And uh, I think you've just accidentally touched on the thing where I think it's helpful that I'm a mechanical engineer because um you just have to garner enough information to fuel the designer with what they need. So even if we'd never designed a, mount, designed a mountain bike before, if we were doing a mountain bike, I don't find that that intimidating because that mountain bike company will have engineers. I'll be able to speak to them. We'll understand the limitations, reduce variables, but still apply really unique new design to it. Mm-hmm. So um, no, like we really would be game for anything. Um, we have super yacht. We have a super yacht project that's not fully green lit, but to me, a super yacht can be as simple a start as doing a kitchen knife. It's just, it's a line, you yeah. know, um, mm-hmm. and, it, and, it, and it grows from there and you just have to learn the industry as you go. Yeah. That, that, um, answer kind of gives me some more, um, insight into the landing the plane story, like, <laughs> because it's, it's a series <laughs> of problems, like you said, and you know, you can, look at each, each little challenge. Yeah, you just got to line them up. Those. Export customs, travel, import customs, domestic logistics. You know, you just have to like set these out um, uh, and make a lot of phone calls. But, but, you know, in a design standpoint, like the, the discovery phase, um, you know, an engineer just by their nature of wanting to understand, I ask a ton of questions. You already are noticing I talk a lot, but it's, you know, I, I'm, just passionate about subjects. So, um, we just try and suck in as much as we can. So one of your Instagram posts I noticed just as I was scrolling through was a, a bourbon or whiskey glass that was like glass and wood, I think in yep. combination, super sleek looking piece, like just awesome. And Thank you, you so made a comment on there, something about like, I bet five bucks, this gets ripped off before we have it in production. Like, is that a common challenge yeah, that man, you have? I had of, an hour- like, I had an hour with a litigation attorney today. Um, I mean, it's relatively public, but you know, a known coffee company like identically ripped off a custom machine that we made for somebody. Mm. Um, and you know, now we have to go through the whole process of a cease and desist, and hopefully, it doesn't go into litigation and stuff. But you know, uh, that one burnt me a little bit because I just thought you're you're a company I respected. Like, why didn't you just approach us and ask if you? I mean, it was like such a yeah they're run by an engineer and I feel like it was just this tunnel vision thing, but like, why didn't you approach us and just say, love this design. Can we license it? Could we use it? You know, yeah. we'll give you 5% of revenue. We'll make the price 5% higher. It's free for them. Right. At that point yeah. in time. Um, but the joking stuff about the, you know, we share everything that we can on Instagram and I got a lot of young guys, engineers, people that work that have dreams of doing entrepreneur stuff that follow us. And I think it's important for us to share the good and the bad. Um, but I also want to share the process of us thinking about designs. And therefore it is slightly comical to mm-hmm. say at points in time, 
yep, somebody else will probably machine that in titanium before we make it in glass, you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, um, having lots of topics that we work on are just diving between different products, though, at least means like, whatever, just park that one in history and move on to the next thing. You know, we'll, we'll do another, we'll not one trick pony it, where we just try to clutch onto this thing. Yeah. Um, so before we hit record here, you were showing me the the Boa and Jordan combo. Tell our listeners a little bit about that project and how that came to be. Um, each year, um, I try to do at least one crazy project where it doesn't necessarily need to make sense, but it keeps our guys uh, fresh, um, probably causes some press and just as an excuse to just be like, let's try it. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, my mom wouldn't let me have Air Jordan ones when I was growing up. She thought they were too rebellious. So, you know, as you inevitably do, as I had a, a little bit of a budget, I started buying Jordan one sneakers. And this is a guy, Dominic, who's, you know, goes by the shoe surgeon on Instagram. He's, you know, massively popular, um, the sort of whole Los Angeles, you know, the rap hip hop crew, but also massive brands. And I worked with them from a PR standpoint. But we had Boa, who are who make this this ratcheting system. Which I guess on the podcast you'll hear the clicking, but they make this ratcheting system um, for bike shoes. And we worked on a project uh, with them for Specialized, um, the bike company, on some shoes. Got a good relationship with them, and I thought, man, I want to do a pair of Jordan ones with a Boa system. Now you can't call Boa and ask them for their products. Like you have to do a code. Like you have to do a. You're in bed with them. Yeah. So I. I got in touch with the shoe surgeon. I was like, Dom, I want to make five pairs of Jordan ones, but they need to lace the Boa system. He's like, I've already thought about doing this. You can't, Boa won't do anything like that. I was like, aha, wait, <laughs> I have a guy there. <laughs> he's like, you got a guy? I was like, yeah, I got a guy. He's the CEO and he thinks this is a cool idea because his son loves Jordans. <laughs> yes. <Nice. laughs> so the project was really fun because Boa kind of like their R&D team kind of got stuck into it. Like this would be fun to play with. And um, I'll show this just because you are YouTube as well. But you know, there's a there's a lacing system to 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 boas, and you know they have a wire that has to flow as it tightens through the the eyelets. Um, and it was it was no joke. Like we had to alter the flex points and stuff on the shoe and, and plan how to make this. Um, uh, but we also because we we're making an Air Jordan one, we had to make less than five sets because it like has to be art. Um, otherwise i would have yes. got the same thing that i just gave to the coffee company the old cease and desist <laughs> you know we did we decided though that uh, in reality this thing was wild enough that um you know the gut feel was if anybody at nike saw it the reaction would be like yep nice job you know yeah well done um so that that was a that was a fun project and that was whatever 2019's wild project um 2020s was a, a race car. 2018s was rebodying a Hoyer Octavia vintage watch, rebodying it with a titanium body um, where we had to scan everything and machine it and stuff. Um, and this year is actually a client project, and it's nutty enough that it's 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 taking the it's taking the bait as the, the crazy one for the year. Uh, yeah. Um. Tell me a little bit about the size and shape of your team. You know, is this, is this mostly you think you have hundreds of people in the back room who are helping you build this stuff out? What's, what's the, no, we're tiny, yeah. um, tiny, tiny. So, uh, we, okay. So at Oakley, I learned the, the, the notion of finding the best partners. So, um, if I owned a CNC machine, all we would do is CNC. We wouldn't do leather. We wouldn't mess with wood, that type of thing. If I owned a giant 1900s letterpress machine, all we would do is make art. Um, so I was pretty conscious of never owning machinery. Uh, but we've got phenomenal partners, um, you know, that we've built over long relationships. So do we execute with hundreds of people? Yes. Um, the team of employees is, uh, my assistant just left to, to, to have a baby and go to nursing school. Um, so no assistant just now. Uh, Kevin's my head of design. Jeremy's my head of engineering. I have another employee in a, that's sort of secretly working on something. Um, uh, it's a startup in the watch space. Uh, and uh, we have two or three other freelance designers that are regularly using most of their hours for us. Mm -hmm. Um but we only take on, you know, like from an actual being like their ID firm, we only take on three or four clients at one time. 
Uh, so I don't have any aspirations of being, I like being manageable. You know, I don't have aspirations yeah. of being a frog or layer or, you know, like a juggernaut. Um, yeah, it's nice staying, staying small and hungry. Talk about some of your design influences or design heroes that you've had, you know, either growing up or, you know, even firms or designers you look up to now. Yeah, it's a funny one that I, I do consider often because, like, I am competitive. So some of the people in our space I look at with a competitive mindset, you know, I, I, who I have a massive amount of respect for is Mark Newson because he's done essentially the company that I want to end up being, which is he maintained just being about four or five employees. Um, I actually uh, did work with Mark on a project um, for McAllen, the whiskey company. And that was, I didn't know what size their team would be. So to walk into their headquarters and know that it was only whatever that is now, I don't know, maybe they're more, but four, five, six Mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Um, and to see the work that they get to execute with Vuitton and Apple and things like that, you know, marked in my mind, this is, I'm not nuts for having this as a business model. I'm not trying to grow. And funnily enough, one of the projects um, in the last sort of year has been a lounge chair. And we joke and we call it the Newson project because, you know, his, <laughs> his uh, Lockheed chairs are I don't know if they go to auction like $10 million now. I was joking with the guys, <laughs> we need a lounge chair, but like just in case this goes right, you know, <laughs> what, if, <laughs> what if 15 or 20 years from now, you know, we're, we're Newson-esque and, you know, we better have a lounge chair in our back pocket that we did in, you know, uh, back in history. <laughs> so uh, hugely respectful of him. But then other than that, honestly, we just, we try to take a lot of inspiration, not from looking at our peers, I really enjoy all of the random like youth rendering and uh, CGI stuff and sort of just, you know, what's in the head of youths on Instagram, Manoush and, and um, uh, just even Pinterest, you know, just sucking, sucking lines. Um, uh, and then, you know, architecture wise, uh, there are some smaller boutique architects that, I, that that probably wouldn't resonate with anybody that I could mention. Dan Brunn is one in Los Angeles who just has like epically clean lines. And I, I love everything that Dan does because it just exudes simplicity, but he's continually playing with light. But um, Zaha's um, use of, Zaha and Frank Gehry's use of compound curves, um, I would never sort of aspired to designing exactly what Zaha Hadid did. I found a lot of it quite like Noosen stuff, very soft, um, malleable, but their use of compound curves is very, very special. Um, and one of our sort of design styles is certainly like incredibly complicated surfaces to execute that are visually very simple. Um, I know when you mentioned the thing about the yacht earlier, just sort of starting as a line or as yeah. a, the blade of a knife or that just was very reminiscent of a Gary <laughs> yeah, 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 kind of yeah, take yeah. on a building. Yep. Um, so in general, for me, I'm just sort of sucking from my, my biggest passion is lines. And so I'm just sucking lines from anything that I can, you know? Mm. Uh, and I find that incredibly enjoyable. One of the other projects I saw on your um, Instagram was the duffel bag. So tell yeah. us a little bit. I know you do some of your projects are, products that you create for yourself. So what, um, tell us a little bit about the bag and about Discommon Goods. Yeah. So the duffel, you know, Discommon Goods was, was accessories for my life to begin with, or things that I was passionate about, you know, the watch wallet, traveling with watches, that type of thing. Um, but you know, I travel a lot and I had always wanted a, a weekend or one that in my mind was sort of done right. But there was a strategic element to it as well, where at the time the creative director to me was a really good friend we then had a client called um, Anson Calder uh, who make uh, leather goods and travel accessories. And I felt like we needed to make the statement of we understand leather. You know, uh, we were quite far down the route of machined items with our accessories, though we started with a leather piece. Like there's a little bit of a difference between a zip up wallet and like a truly functioning duffel bag. Mm-hmm. But honestly, it was a hilarious story when you, when you, you know, align my obsession with product with just making something like that from scratch. Um, again, now I have a huge amount of humility towards making luggage because it's hard and we <laughs> cocked it up like numerous times. I mean, 
there are hilarious stories. I mean, the bag was like four and a half years. I, I, the designer was one of my good friends, Kyle, who was a um, uh, designer and developer at Oakley. And we always talked about doing a bag together. Like, I mean, the first master sample that was really good that had all of the details that we liked, the day it arrived with Kyle in um, Venice Beach, California, some dude just smashed the window of his car and took the duffel bag out and went. We never even got to review the master sample. <laughs> it was the only one in existence. <laughs> And then the factory that made it got acquired by like a Taiwanese company and then we weren't allowed to use them anymore. Oh. <laughs> so like there is just there was like year long setback after year long setback. Shinola, the the American mm-hmm. brand, they essentially took the design of it for a year. We developed duffel bags, designed and developed duffel bags with them for for over a year. And then one day the creative director just decided they were going a different direction. I was like, can I, can I, have, can I have my bag back? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, you killed it. I was almost going to produce it and you, you took it. Now can I have it back again, please? And we did. We actually, that was great. <laughs> I, I, the Shinola team are brilliant. Um, yeah. But they, they gave us it back. Uh, anyway, so the, the, the Duffel's been this great journey. We make it now with a company called Korchmar that are America's oldest briefcase company. Um, we made a you know a limited run of them, and it's gone quite well for us. Um, this might be shifting gears a little bit. Tell us about one of your proudest professional moments. You know, this is not the wholesome one. Like the wholesome one was the PPE stuff and what we executed. Mm-hmm. Um, but like just the first time that I saw press on things that I respected. You know, when when I logged in one day and my dad saw it before I did to uncrate.com and we were the front page, you know, my brain just melted. Um, I mean, that's just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer from R&D at, at Oakley and now we're sort of being accepted. And then there was one sentence uh, on, and I forget if it was High Snobiety or Hype Beast once, but it just, the, the sentence started, design powerhouse this common. And I just remember sitting at my desk, just shaking, like, what do we do? You know, <laughs> nobody even knows we exist. Really cool. yeah, somebody, somebody wrote that, you know, and, and that was pretty, it was just those little moments of recognition. Um, you know, when you're in a field that you're inherently somewhat secure, insecure, um, th- they are special, but seeing things become real makes you proud. So again, I'm sorry, the podcast people can't see, but I'm holding a set of headphones here that we designed for a company in London. Um, and we were through the entire development process with them on this, you know, helping them with Asia, basically. Um, and that's why we can't take on many clients. You know, that was fully absorbing for, for a long period of time. But, you know, when you get a production pair of those in a box through the mail, you know, in UPS, and you just sort of look at it in a daze if we did this, you know? <laughs> There's that hashtag real designer ship. And uh, we basically, uh, we have, you know, the handshake with with our team that we will not take on a client if we don't think that they're going to make that product real. Like that's the pride thing. Mm. They they, they need to have some iota of possibility of making the thing real. Yeah. Um, So this is a question I've asked everyone who's ever been on the show. Um, And this could be anything, right? Could be life, could be, food could be design, but the common thread here, and you've kind of touched on it already. Designers are a very obsessive group. (laughs) We find many things to get obsessed with. So I'm curious what it is you find that you're most obsessed with right now. I, I, I really might have gasoline in my veins. I, I continually think about vehicles and the emotive response that they evoke out of somebody while driving. So this is a driving thing. Sometimes it's the design. It obviously causes you to have a a reaction, a visual reaction to it. But um, when you own a company or when you work so much, like, and especially if we have the the Asia side as well, like there's very little off time, you know, in Mm -hmm. whatever time it is, just now six o'clock in the evening, um, uh, in two hours, you know, the WeChats will start. And so for me, these drives that I get to do are extremely special because if you're driving hard, you know, and you're in a car that has character, that's all you're thinking about. So I think I'm, I'm obsessive about the things that allow me to switch off. Um, mountain biking is another one. Um, the things that I'm close to obsessive about are vintage watches. But they fall in there like close to obsessive. I'm in control of that. <laughs> like the car <laughs> thing is an actual problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, so maybe these are things you can't talk about, but I'm just curious what's next for Discommon. Like, do you have any, any big projects on the horizon or <clears throat> maybe if the current ones are ones you can't talk about and do you have like a, a no, dream I, I mean, product I, that you'd like to tackle? That's funny. Sorry. You stopped me on my tracks there. Th those are two different points and I actually can address each one. So All right, um, let's do it. Like the big projects on the, the so I'm immensely proud of the work that we do for medical companies, like because we do so many, what would be considered luxury goods to be so deeply rooted in with butterfly and one other medical company that is unfortunately under non-disclosure, like to do stuff that actually helps people that checks that I can go home at night and sleep. Like, yeah. okay, we do some good. Um, but you know, they tend to be like, you know, when the FDA is involved, that's just the stressful projects, right? They're always stressful. So we have one that this year that uh, we'll finish by the end of this year that is um, for a global hotel group, one of the nicer hotel groups in the world. Um, they're building a new hotel in a place and we are doing a close to 50 foot long machined installation that is going to hang from a roof mm. and it's ours to execute. Um, and it is real. I just saw the first panels of it today, actually. Mm. And it is mortifyingly scary because we are hanging this thing from a ceiling in a restaurant. Um, and like, I think, I feel like that's enough information on it that it at least lets you understand that it's intimidating. <laughs> right. But also, I think the concept of it going somewhere, you know, I, I, I hope that this is going to be another sort of tiered chapter for us where like, once we've put that in, that becomes, that's an article in itself, right? That people will read and write about. Um, and something on that scale should put us in this zone of like, my goodness, they do cell phone cases to this. Um, this is very strange. You know, we should maybe talk to these guys. So that that was very exciting just because it's, and that's the one I mentioned, like the big project that we're not doing yeah. any other crazy projects this year. That's, that's the crazy enough. one for the year. <laughs> <laughs> There's structural engineers and mechanical engineers and people promising me that like, you know, these resin anchors won't fall out of concrete and all. You know, it's just, oh, it's big. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Some sort of net in between. <laughs> it's some, oh gosh, I would like it. Yeah. Like <laughs> extra cables that like right. grab onto the thing if it ever falls. Luckily it's not in an earthquake prone area. Uh, so that's that's crazy. Um, and so, oh, you said dream project. Um, mm -hmm. My dream project is super mundane, um, and I really, but I really want to do it. I want to do a power tool. Um, mm -hmm. I want to walk into Home Depot and see something that we did. Um, and I feel like, to some extent, and I would happily be wrong, but I feel like power tools are just sort of lost in this highly aggressive visual mm -hmm. right now where there's just ridges everywhere and TPUs and rubbers and it's just, everything's aggressive. Um, and the same way that like uh, Nest and Ring and um, Ekabee and stuff like that sit in mm -hmm. their own areas in Home Depot and Lowe's and stuff like that. And they're, you know, quite aesthetically different than the rest of the stuff in there. I feel like there's room in a you know, power tool for that. And uh, like, that's a, that's a, you know, the real designer ship type thing. That would be a, highly sought after thing for me. So if it could be any power tool, what's your, what's your gut or just any power tool? Oh, sorry. A drill because a drill. Uh, okay. It, drills fascinate me, right? They're made to be, you know, fully indestructible and contractors are supposed to use them. And it's supposed to be five, five years of just brutal work, but mostly drills get used to hang pictures in houses right <laughs> that's just what they do right. they drill a hole in drywall and then you know they screw something into it uh, and i'm just i i just love them my, my actually a whole bunch of my obsession of design comes from my dad had um a cabled black and decker drill i don't know it might even have been from the 70s maybe the 80s when i was growing up but like its housing was, you know, die cast something as zinc or aluminum alloy and you just plugged in this rope and it just worked always. Mm -hmm. It probably still, he might still have it actually. But I also believe just now, like one of my massive peeves, uh, I don't know if we're going to touch on this later, but you know, with design is, is it's actually design. my next question. So oh. <laughs> you can just okay. so plow right into question. it. <laughs> I, I, um, I can't, I cannot fathom why stuff is just, why it's okay for it to break. Now, maybe I'm just a naive businessman and people want it to break, so you buy new ones. Um, 
but if the question was going to be, you know, what do you dislike in in design? Uh, fast design like traumatizes me, and the one most specific product is Qi chargers for cell phones. Qi QI chargers oh, for cell uh-huh. phones. Yeah. Um. Uh, we had to put Qi charging in a medical device at one point in time, and I and I found out that like. I don't know, there's somewhere in the region of 300 Qi certified factories in China that make these chargers. And it's one piece of shitty injection molded plastic, coil, one piece of shitty injection molded plastic put together and is a completely disposable item. And there are now, I would guess, um, there must be hundreds of millions, if not close to billions of them out there. And they're Mm -hmm. essentially worthless to people because the whole principle of a Qi charger makes no sense to me. Your phone has to be laying on it to charge. Therefore, you can't use your phone. Whereas if your phone is plugged into a cable, it's now completely usable. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's my, like, what am I obsessively mad at? I, I, like cheap, fast design. To me, there's no excuse for it. Even if you're injection molding a cheap plastic part, there can still be hugely considerable effort put into yeah. the surfaces, the functionality, the durability, the live hinge design, the snap fit designs to make this thing a good product, you know? So what if you weren't designing? What would you do if, if you couldn't design tomorrow? What would, what would be your, your new career? I'm not fast enough to be a race car driver. I would, I'd like to, uh, but I'm definitely not good (laughs) enough to be that. So I'm not just going to give that cliched answer. Yeah. Um, I often, often think back to, I wanted to be an archaeologist um, when I was younger and I've never really analyzed where that ties into my life, but I would like to be unearthing Mm. objects. I don't know how much archaeology is left, you know, to do anymore. Um, It would have been that or an architect, but you know, an architect is designing. Yeah, that's cool. uh, I'm fascinated by in the same way, like with automobiles, like I'm fascinated about finding a barn find, like the concept of digging something up and being the first one to see it in X thousand years. Wow. You know, like humanity passed that whole thing by and you know, that person then found it. Yeah. I love that. Um, okay. As we're winding down here, I'm curious what your, maybe your favorite piece of advice is that you've received, or maybe one of your favorite pieces of advice to pass along to your team. Um, yeah. Can I get, can I, can I give two, uh, one, one is, uh, and relatively in different worlds known saying, but there's an independent watchmaker called Max Busser, uh, Maximilian Busser. He has a watch company called MBNF. And um, he has a saying, I I think it's his, but a creative adult is a child that survived. Um, And I watch my kids a lot. You know, they're they're dreaming, they're drawing, they're building, they're creating. And I just try to hang on to that sense of mischief. We're a mischievous firm. Mm -hmm. Um, And this shit doesn't need to be serious. You know, like we should be having fun doing this. Like we're making new stuff for the world. Like stop take the pull out your butt, you know, like, like stop being so serious. Enjoy <laughs> this. Like what, what better dream than creating? Um, the other one is a business piece of advice because I, I, I think I'm a, you know, hold some investments in, in, in other firms and I, and I, I tried to be a fairly tactical businessman, but, um, a good friend of mine gave me the term teeth and tusks. Um, and that is an elephant shows, defends and intimidates with his tusks but he still has to eat with his teeth. And um, that has made me very, very conscious of the blend of, you know, retainer clients, licensing fees, taking a, a portion of revenue if, if the company's wanting to do it, that in the background allows your teeth to exist. Um, but for us, you know, the projects that you see when you Google are the tusks and they're the middle finger. And I think um, a lot of people only maybe see or think about our tusks and certainly to younger guys, I would want to, to push them to consider their teeth. How are you going to eat? You know, I love that metaphor. I've never heard that before, but I will, I will certainly pass that along. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's served me quite well. Like I have to keep analyzing the project, like, you know, making 9.6 million of something that you only take two cents on is still a pretty darn good project if it comes in front of you. Right. <laughs> yeah. We'll take that. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Do you have any asks or encouragement of our listeners? Anything you want to challenge our listeners to do differently? Um, I, I do. I, I do these things um, on Instagram. We try and do them weekly. They're called discussions, um, where we take questions. Um, and one of the recurring themes that we that we talk about is like the never settling standpoint, where. Um, you know, depending on the people, your circle that you're with, depending on who you surround yourself with, depending on even like the town that you live in, um, it can be easy to be intimidated and think I shouldn't strive for the thing that I kind of really know inside me that I want to do. That fire, like if it's somewhere there, you're kind of screwed. Like it's just going to keep burning and you're going to maybe keep asking it to stop yelling at you, but it's going to be there. And so, you know, in, in your 20s and, you know, and even when you're younger, like you have so much room to play in that in that period of time, you know, and and that should be the non-settling period. Yeah, I love that. Neil, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, tell our listeners where they can find you guys online and track you down on the interwebs. Yeah, we pretty much live on on Instagram uh, at Discommon. Uh, I have not had that taken away from me by our P- PR firm yet. I've probably done enough things that they will try to at some point in time. But it's me uh, at Discommon, and, and we interact a lot on it. Um, and Discommon.com is our website, but uh, most of our active sharing is on Instagram. Love it. Well, Neil, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, that was great fun, man. Thank you very much for for allowing me to blether. It's a good Scottish word for you. You're welcome. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode 160 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.